join me in welcoming Wolfgang to the stage. Hello, welcome everyone at AWE Berlin. Um, and first of all, sorry for my voice. I've actually completely lost it over the weekend. So I hope I can keep it up for the next 20 minutes. Um, if I have to, have to drink water at some point, uh, forgive me. Uh, just to quickly introduce myself, my name is uh, Wolfgang Sterzle. I'm the CEO of the company you might have uh, known or you might have heard in the major announcement from. We do augmented and virtual reality software solutions and we're based in Munich. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, augmented and virtual reality and about the, uh, about the industry companies and how are they using augmented reality and virtual reality um, because there have been a lot of investments made in the last couple of months and, and years and I want to quickly or I want to analyze why, why that has happened and how companies think uh, they can make money with augmented reality. So first of all, to quickly give you an overview um, based on also what Ori said in the morning um, on the couple of market facts, the augmented and virtual reality investments hit 1.1 billion in Q2 um, 2016, so this year. Um, augmented reality company Magic Leap closed an investment round of 800 million on its own. Apple was acquired by Meta uh, Apple acquired Metayu, as you might know. Um, Blipper raised an investment round of 45, uh, 54 million. Bosch invested in us. Um, PTC has bought a platform called Vuforia, and Vuforia is already um, part of the exhibition here. Um, augmented reality market hits um, 120 billion by 2020. Uh, you, might, you might have heard about that figure. Um, and Tim Cook says augmented reality is bigger than virtual reality in the future, and Apple kind of focuses on augmented reality rather than virtual reality. So overall, the investments in VR and AR are ongoing and, and basically going more and more. Today, I also want to take the opportunity um, to, to say something um, because Augmented reality, or Germany, is a very strong augmented reality country, actually. There is many companies um, like Fraunhofer focused on tracking, like the Technical University in Munich, very strong in industrial augmented reality. Metayo has basically been brought augmented reality to life for, for masses. Volkswagen is working a lot on, on augmented reality. What I see now, though, is the majority of investments are being made in the US um, and in, in, in the Asian region. So because we're here in Berlin today, I really want to take the opportunity to kind of motivate everyone here in the room um, and not lose the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the advantage we had in the last couple of years um, by not continuing the investments now as the market is really taking off. So I'm asking myself the questions, why do the companies, the investors, the customers invest so much money into the area. And I've searched for a video. Some of you might already know it. Maybe it's because people are having fun. <laughs> I've probably seen that video for a hundred times and I, I still laugh. Um, that's probably not the only case, um, at least uh, for the area we're in, uh, in, in augmented reality. That's, of course, an, a big area for virtual reality um, in gaming. But there are really many areas to earn money in. And I want to outline a couple of areas um, where I think uh, companies are going to earn money in. Um, and that starts off with the left side, this, the studios, basically doing augmented and virtual reality projects. Um, the disadvantage is, of course, that it's not very scalable. So you do a project, a one-off project, and then it's, it's gone again. Um, and you can't, protect kind of, you can't protect your IP. Um, the advantage is, though, that, the, that you can create a network, that you can figure out what do customers out there really want, um, where do they have um, the major benefits in using AR and VR technologies. Um, so I'm... We've done a lot of projects in the past, and we've exactly figured that out. So where's the pain points, especially in industry companies, and where can they make use of the technologies? 
Um, the second area I want to talk about is the hardware area. Of course, the, um, a, a lot of investors are focusing um, on, on hardware. Um, and you might have seen a partnership announced just recently um, between Microsoft and ThyssenKrupp. And ThyssenKrupp have kind of committed to order 24,000 HoloLenses. And just imagine um, if, if a, a HoloLens drops down by, let's say, a third of the price to what it is right now to, let's say, 1,000 euro, then it's already a revenue of 24 million uh, euro. And that's just for one single company. That's the reason why people or why investors invest so heavily into that um, hardware delivery. And as Ori said in the morning as well, maybe the augmented reality classes will kind of substitute in the future what we already have with tablets and smartphones and stuff like that. And I'm very convinced that at least in the industry companies, this is going to happen. The advantage is, of course, there's a lot of room for IP protection um, and, uh, and um, there's a lot of room to create revenue. It's a very scalable business, but it is very cost intensive. So that's why Magic Leap raised the round of 800 million euro. Incredible number. Um, before I come to the middleware, which is the area actually what I want to focus on, I want to jump to the right side, uh, which is the aggregation. That's basically where um, content is being published. So it could be a kind of an app store, like the, the iTunes store or the Google Play store. It could be an application which is just um, uh, distributing content out, of, uh, out on the market, uh, talking about Facebook, for example. Um, it has the functionality to distribute virtual reality content uh, right now, so 360-degree uh, videos. Some, some might argue that's not real virtual reality. Um, but that's basically channels to distribute content on a wider uh, market. What is especially important um, to me today is the, the area of the middleware. And I want to focus on, on the middleware part in a special sector, um, which is the enterprise area. And the enterprise area um, is what you can see here on the top left side. If you break it down from the big forecast 120 million, or what it says, 90, 90 billion here, it comes down to 6 billion. Um, in my opinion, it is a very small number, and, and I think that's way bigger. If you, for example, just look at the automotive after-sales market, it is a market of a size of about 800 billion. Of course, there's a lot of hardware ongoing, and there's a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, software and uh, solutions and services and stuff. But if you, if you just take a tiny piece and imagine that software is helping the after-sales market to, to solve the problems, um, then it can already be way more than just the six billion, just in the auto automotive aftermarket. And the reason is very clear, um, because the, co the industry companies out there, they want to do two things, basically. They want to decrease costs or increase their revenue. And with both technologies, AR and VR, and I'm going to show a couple of use cases um, in a second, that's easily possible. And I've put together a slide where I see, or where we see, applications um, where the technologies pop into place. And that could be an everyday assistant. Um, it's not Pokemon Go, that's not kind of an assistant. Um, but you might know um, uh, location-based services which are already on the market. Um, you, you can imagine that augmented reality um, applications help to service your coffee machine in the future, stuff like that. Repair and maintenance is a big, big market. And I want to show a couple of uh, applications also for the teleservices and remote sector um, in, in a second. Set up installation, how to use. Whoever has built an IKEA cupboard in the past knows that it kind of seems easy, but it then becomes a major issue um, when you work on it. So using augmented reality on a smart device or a tablet or a smart glass um, could help a lot in the future um, to really set things like that up. Customer support, collaborative network, emergency assistant, all areas where the technologies can reduce costs or increase revenue. And I want to give you a couple of examples um, to, to show you that it's been proven already. That's an application um, we, we did together with Atlas Copco or Liebold. Um, it's a vacuum pump. And we did um, create a step-by-step -step instruction manual with augmented reality on a tablet. Yes, uh, we did it on a tablet because that's what the technicians currently have. They don't have AR glasses yet. 
And we basically um, show them how to, to just change uh, the oil in the machine. Very simple use case. But we thought, why not giving it to people who have never done that before? Never, ever. And we actually figured out they could do it with the application because it just showed exactly at the point where you have to remove a screw where, um, um, what, you, what you actually have to do. Um, so it did work out for people who have never done that repair. And for people who did the repair already, they said, well, using augmented reality and having checkboxes or giving feedbacks to the systems that you have done a step, for example, could improve productivity significantly. And to prove that, our partner Bosch, um, which, uh, who are, which are already um, or also downstairs in the exhibition, they have done a survey um, with technicians, and over 50 technicians uh, in the automotive area participated um, of all ages and experiences. And as you can see, I'm not sure if I have a laser pointer, as you can see on the, um, on the blue line, basically, to the uh, center line, which is basically the average uh, of, of all the values, uh, simple, fast, precise, work relevant, worthwhile, reliable, augmented reality improved in every area significantly. Um, and one technician said, and that's a bit too uh, small now, so I need to turn around. Wiring harness and connector locations are very difficult to find without the use of a manual. This system would save us hours of lost time. So everyone knowing that uh, cars become more and more complex um, because of all the electricity and all the wires and all the connectors know that visualizing this with AR um, is a major benefit to the technicians. AIR can be used on industry machineries to visualize dynamic data from the machine at the point where it's actually relevant for the machine. So you just walk through a fabric hall and you get the data located directly on the machine where it's applicable. Um, augmented reality is already being used in a smart manual. Um, Audi has done an application, Audi e Quartz Info, if you know that. And what you do there, if uh, such a signal lamp is basically popping up, you can scan the lamp and then you get a solution to it. Um, or you stand right in front of your engine bay um, and you can't imagine how many people can't exchange water um, for their wipers or, ex uh, or fill up the oil. And it shows you exactly where you have to do that, just putting the phone over the engine bay um, and, and visualizing on top of the engine um, where the action needs to be. A big area which you probably see a lot um, also here on the exhibition is uh, teleservices area. So imagine a technician on the other side of the world can't continue to solve a problem. Um, he needs an expert. Today, many, many industry companies still do that with a normal landline phone. And they have the problem to actually point towards the action, to point towards the error. Um, connecting it with video using augmented reality annotations where the expert can show where the problem is or the te technician can show the expert what he thinks is a major benefit. And that's definitely going to come. It's already there, actually. I want to give you two more examples out of the aftermarket um, in the automotive area from sales support um, at the point of sale. And they're basically very diff different on the one hand, but very similar on the other hand. So BMW, for example, is using augmented reality at the dealership to visualize what the car can actually do, what benefits the car have, which accessories you can buy on top of the car. Um, and once you've done that, there's just simple things like taking a picture with your new car and sending it to your friends. That kind of creates a relationship to the brand. It's a very useful thing, very successful. On the opposite, Audi is working a lot with VR. So Audi has basically brought its entire car configurator into VR. So you can exchange the rims, you can exchange uh, the interior. Um, you can do everything what you can do in a web configurator, put a glass on, and basically experience your self-configured car. And what Audi's opinion on that is that they want to kind of create um, experiences where cus which customers normally never have. So what you've just seen here is an experience on a moon landscape. Audi would normally never do that because you, or you cannot access a moon or whatever. But they say that's emotional 
um, binding to the company. They, so they want to kind of create these environments with VR. But the main point I want to talk about, and that was actually the starting point um, from the middleware section on my presentation, is all that can be done in, on a project basis. So there's many companies, many agencies out there um, being able to implement such applications, which you've just seen on the screen, um, with a lot of effort. So when industry companies want to use AR and VR, they want to know how they can do it not only with one car in one language and for one use case, they want to do it for all their cars in 27 languages and for hundreds of different use cases. So basically the key, in my opinion, to the, to the success of augmented reality is not only the hardware, which is continuously improving and which you're going to see a lot in the next two days, also in the hardware section tomorrow morning, but it's really about the content. Companies need to be able to create content in a very cost-efficient way and ideally in an already known way um, to be able to use the technologies. And now come to um, just my, my little piece of, of promotion to that. We as a company, we kind of focus on that niche, on that middleware sector, basically. Um, and we offer platforms which enable the companies to create augmented and virtual reality content. And one platform which we also showcase downstairs is what my partner Karim already introduced this morning. It's about Reflect One. And I want to quickly show you what that is exactly. With Reflect One's award-winning technology, take your maintenance and training processes to the next level by visualizing any data directly onto your machine, product, or working environment. Reflect One enables industry companies to create in-house augmented reality applications for visual instructions, interactive checklists, or training scenarios with existing editing systems. With the platform, we enable industry companies to use the very powerful augmented reality technology in a very cost-efficient and fast way. Captured in real time from working sensors, Reflect One is an IoT-ready solution that allows you to view dynamic data directly in your augmented reality app. In the past, software engineers needed weeks to program and implement individually programmed augmented reality apps. With Reflect One, the company's authors can do the same in just a few hours without any programming skills. Import, connect, and publish. Reuse your existing content such as CAD data, animations, rich media, diagnostic data, or 3D models and link it to real objects. Reflect One allows you to publish augmented reality apps to mobile devices and smart glasses for iOS, Android, and Windows platforms. Reflect One is the most powerful platform for creating augmented reality content in the industry. So whether or not you're using Reflect One, if you're an industry company, you need to think about scalability and you need to, in my opinion, do that from or before you actually do the first product um, or project because that's actually the key to the success of the technology. One last bit is the, if companies follow more, one or more than uh, business models um, from, from uh, the top row, um, it's an integrated business model, uh, an integrated business model, and they, they're basically followed by the big um, ecosystem providers, by the big five, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, and I can guarantee, and you will probably see a lot of solutions um, in the exhibition as well, all the four or all the five uh, companies are working in these areas heavily. Um, on, the one side, uh, on the one side, in terms of providing SDKs for creating software, providing app stores to distribute uh, solutions, creating hardware to make it easier to access. So a lot of different areas. And I think that's very good for the technology that these companies are investing so much money because that's also key to success. But still, there are many niches where other companies in other areas can jump in and make sure they use these ecosystems. And that's actually what I want to close with. AR and VR is kind of still in its infancy. Um, you, as you might have, or as you've seen maybe this morning on the Gartner hype cycle, AR is kind of 
um, short before um, tapping into that gap of dissolution, um, taking off then afterwards. VR is a little bit further ahead now, but it's still very early. So there's still the need for finding the proper use cases on the industry side and also for finding the right business models on the companies on the agency side. M most companies are pre-product, pre-revenue, um, and pivot and reposition a lot. But you need to start working with AR and VR because as, for example, Mark Zuckerberg says, eventually we're going to have what looks like normal looking glasses that can do both augmented and virtual reality in 10 years. And then um, physical objects like today, like a TV for displaying an image will actually just be a $1 app in the App Store. Thank you very much and look forward to talk to you later on. Thank you.